welcome to Australia in Space TV. My name is Chris Cubbage. I'm the executive editor with My Security Media and publishers of the Australia in Space magazine. Today, we're joined by Flavia Tada Nardini. She is the CEO and co-founder with Fleet Space Technologies based in Adelaide. They have a cluster of satellites uh, and another launch scheduled with SpaceX in March 2023. Um, we're also going to be discussing the exosphere their earth scanning technology. So without further ado, from Adelaide, Flavia Tata Nardini. Welcome uh, to Australia in Space TV. Great to have you there. You're in Adelaide. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, Thanks so thank you very me. much for joining us. <laughs> um, now Fleet, you only need to start looking at what Fleet is doing uh, there in South Australia to start to be very, very impressed. Today we're going to talk about the exosphere. Um, and what you're doing in your uh, sort of earth scanning technology, as you put it, but again, quite incredible. Uh, introduce us to space and uh, hopefully we'll get a little bit about your background as well uh, in terms of what you're doing in your satellite uh, cluster. Absolutely. So um, first of all, I am talking to you from Adelaide. We are in a second warehouse of fleet. We got two right. warehouses here. We're growing very much. So we were like two people in a dream uh, five years ago. We are now hundred people <laughs> and a bigger dream. Uh, so you see behind me, uh, everything that is happening in this warehouse is related to exosphere. Uh, so to understand how we got into creating exosphere, you need to understand that when Meta and I came together uh, to build fleets, so we had a big thesis and a big vision how to use satellite data to enable industry. They usually don't use satellite data because it's too expensive. Yeah. Um, if you look at the incumbent satellites for industrial connectivity, they they really sell data for $1,000 per megabyte or really big numbers. So it is complex for industry to use them. So our idea was like, can we build small satellites and a constellation of small satellites? So kind of change the economics in the sky yeah. so that we can serve industry that never been able to use space data, you know? Kind of what Starlink and SpaceX are doing for broadband we wanted to do it for things. So we started building this constellation of spacecraft around 40 kilos that more or less have got the same performance of a 400 kilogram satellite. So that is not an easy achievement, it's very complex. So we worked really, really hard on technologies in the sky and we built the satellites and we changed the economics. The other side of this interesting vision was like, what are we gonna do with it? What are the industry worth of changing? really, when once you have availability of industrial data. And we fell in love with the critical minerals in the past four years. Uh, big believers of energy transition, you know, EV cars, uh, sustainable energy, solar panels, you name it, okay? And we are very, very lucky because we've got satellites in the sky. So we thought, what if we tackle this problem? What and, if and we solve it? Just going back to that is, um, because you're using uh, the exosphere is the ambient noise uh, tomography. Um, were you aware of that before you started Fleet? Like, <laughs> have you, or have you been kind of building this as you go along and the technology has kind of been following and you're inventing? Because you're using 3D printing, you're doing some amazing things. Yeah, what, where have you been linking this uh, through? What came first? What really came first is the idea of building 3D printed satellites with beam forming, very advanced, very small, to kind of give a limited data for industries. So yeah. that was like the enabler. We needed to build the enabler. Now, day two of fleet, we started looking into industry and we went from agriculture and environmental, uh, logistics, critical infrastructure. We were looking for something uh, that once you change the economies in the sky, that could really get, get benefit. And we kind of settled on three, four applications that we really liked. And all of them are regarding industry remote areas. So we had power lines or hydro company, gas pipelines. And then four years ago, we got inspired by a photo of Buzz Aldrin in yeah. 1969. He went to the moon, as we know. And, but not a lot of people know that he left a seismic device on the moon. A seismic device measured the moonquakes. And they didn't measure a lot of moonquakes, but it was 1969. So they didn't have the quantum computing that they had today. And now they are analyzing the data with machine learning and they realize there's a lot of quakes in the, in the moon and they are understanding the subsurface on the moon. So we thought, okay, if NASA is doing this, can we do it on earth? Can we use devices on the ground to scan earth? 
and we look in, start looking into what is called ambient noise tomography. That is sounds like pretty pretty crazy stuff, but the, what it is, it's the ability to understand the natural humming of the earth, like waving on the side or not, um, to actually understand what rocks are underneath earth down to two and a half kilometers. That is very complex because usually to do that, we need to drill. And humans have been drilling for a long time, many, many holes, with little to very, very tiny, if not thing success. We want to change that. So, so we, you don't need to put yeah. the sensors on, the, on Earth, right? You put the sensors out there rather than drilling. You put the sensors on the ground and then your satellites come over and sort of Gather capture the data. the data. Yeah. So you see, I think, behind me, this blue devices that you see here. Yeah. Those are called the geodes. So the geodes are our devices that goes on the ground. So we use the same technology in the sky. We use it on the ground. So while with our satellites we do beam forming and we see Earth, these devices go underneath. So it's, as I always smile, it's very counterintuitive that you need to go 500 kilometers up in the sky to look two and a half kilometers down. But yeah. it's, it's a big data problem. So usually in the middle of nowhere, it's gigabits of data. It's impossible to transfer. So we have built satellites that can transfer this amount of data. We have built technology in these devices that can see underneath Earth. So we can spot uh, lithium deposits or a copper or a nickel in days instead of many, many years and many, many drill holes. So it's a bit of a game changer. And now you've got a constellation of six satellites uh, and you've got another two coming uh, later this year. Is that right? So there are seven and there are the three coming. So the numbers are more and more and more and they get more. You know, now we are starting 3D printing all our satellites and completely vertically integrate. So in this warehouse that you see behind me, got very big 3D printers. No one 3D prints satellites, it's very unique. We got patents all around the world and it's just fleet at the moment. But why we did it? We did it because you can choose smaller geometries. So it's lighter. And we do it because we own the supply chain. And supply chain is not fun lately. You know, during COVID and the past three years, pieces right. coming from around the world, it's complicated. So by using these advanced technologies, now we can mass manufacture satellites 3D printed. And what's your launch platform? How do you get them up? So we use SpaceX most of the time. Right. <laughs> so we send them to, to California. There is not, sometimes we use a, a rocket company in New Zealand called Rocket Lab. Yes. Uh, there are uh, rockets that are trying to get into space from Australia and we are a big fan and supporter. Hopefully they'll get there. Uh, the launch cost has been going down so much with the advent of SpaceX in the past 10 years. So that's problems always about to be solved. You know, yeah. remember when we were launching satellites seven years ago, it would cost me a million of dollars per teeny tiny satellite. Now my satellite is 20 times bigger and 20 times cheaper. So that's in the window of time of five years. So this industry is really allowing, and you know, I always make the joke like that we, we launch Elon Musk build this amazing rocket that allows us to launch satellites constantly. And we use our satellites to find lithium that he uses for Tesla. So it's kind of uh, the, the space industry is creating this loop. You get and, a you get a discount for that though. <laughs> I, I think there should be <laughs> discount, but it is the beauty of the space industry, you know, that starting building things that feel very high tech, but at the end they they help Earth to be a better yeah. place and they help humankind to do the step forward, you know. Well, look, the website's definitely worth having a look at, and so is the uh, Exosphere video. Uh, very, very good. I love the music in that too, but it is an amazing <laughs> technology. Yeah. Um, I've got some questions maybe on the satellites. I take it you can manoeuvre them and change their orbit a little bit as well? And so, what type of orbits are you covering now? So the satellites are around 540 kilometres from Earth. This is called low Earth orbit. So they are not like in geostats, you know, 36,000 kilometers are very close. So they last there three to five years. Right. We launch them in different orbits. Uh, most of the time depends where the rocket is going. And uh, they, they, in one day, the satellites see every side of the world. So they really travel fast. Uh, they, yeah, it's just amazing to think that one of our satellites has probably done 5,000 plus orbits. And, you know, I've seen the sky, the, the yeah. space from the, the world from space 5,000 times. So we have propulsion systems on board now, uh, so we can maneuver them. But the idea is also, you know, to change them. 
every generation of these satellites has matter because, you know, we use the latest technology. So we are not building something that's going to last 50 years. Right. And at the end of their lifetime, they go back into the atmosphere and they completely disintegrate. So they're also not a, a space debris hazard. So that, that is very important. What type of material are they made of? So we use aluminum. So yeah. our 3D printer can 3D print titanium, aluminum, many other materials, but most is aluminum. Yeah. Wonderful. So when is your next launch with SpaceX? So it's around March. I think we're okay. going to have three satellites around March with SpaceX and then others. So every six months we launch. You know, yeah. now it's, uh, we're kind of in a rhythm. <laughs> and it is, uh, you know, this year we had on board so many customers in Australia, North America, South America, and the more satellites, the more customers we have. We really want to accelerate this energy transition and contribute to humankind. We, you know, The only thing that I care more about in this world that, that, you know, probably my daughters and my family is making sure that the humankind don't make the same mistakes, yes, you know, yes. going ahead with their, their progress, but drill all earth looking for stuff that should help us. So this technique, it is incredible and it's going to yes. reduce drilling a lot. And this is why our satellites are needed. What type of customer, maybe if you, a little bit about your business model and your customer profile, you mentioned you've got customers um, ar around the world, but yeah, what, what type of customers come to you and are they just buying the data uh, or are they sort of uh, getting sort of the exploration? Are you, are you involved in, with that as well? So we uh, give them an end-to-end service, not, not really an end-to-end -end service. It's an exploration company is really that come to us, or critical mineral exploration companies that are looking for cobalt, copper, lithium, nickel, and uh, rare hertz, you know, gold, silver. And usually they drill. So their budgets are done of mainly drilling. And drilling is hard because most of the things yeah. that we have found, we already found it, uh, already on, 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 the, on, the, on the high level of the rocks. So these are our buyers, usually exploration managers. They get the geodes, an array of them for one year or three years, and they use it to scan uh, the, the, the area that they want to try to find. And as part of that, they get the data connectivity, they get the machine learning, the 3D image of the deposit that is built during three, four days, and uh, they deploy them. They usually deploy, they stack them in the ground. So. It's a kind of a subscription per year that gives them the entire experience. And that makes it a bit different from other satellites because usually other satellite company just, just give you the data, but the data is almost becoming a commodity, like just transfer data from point A, point B. I think what's interesting is the information. So the thing that they want to know, there is a deposit there, it is lithium. We will not be, have to do 10,000 drill holes. We will do five and it's going to be good. So. What's the business case for them? How much, what, how would you compare the two? What's the, what's the saving for them? Oh, these companies, uh, you know, they, uh, the, in average, for, to find a deposit, you probably have to do 10,000, 6,000 to 10,000 drill holes in the years. Okay. Wow. So like that's kind of, and, and, and it's hard. It's hard to get licenses and stuff like that. I think every drill holes can cost a couple of hundred K and also the logistics and the movements and the time. So it is saving time. It is saving cost of drilling, but it's also environmental impact. So the ESG uh, roadmap. So I think that with the cost is it, the same cost and they, it's incredible. It's and just- I take it, And I think well, also with the drilling, it's a bit selective too. They have to be lucky uh, as well. Whereas you are covering a large area uh, and you're going down, it looks like, are you going down a couple of kilometres? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, they're getting quite accurate feeds, right? Very um, much so. Yeah. You did a test with, it was a greenfield uh, exploration. Maybe just yeah. talk us through how that worked and uh, sort of the test of that. And, you know, we have done with uh, greenfield, we have done it. Another one that is quite public as well is what we have achieved with coal lithium in, fin in Finnis. Uh, beautiful company in the north of uh, um, Northern Territory and in their Finnish uh, lithium deposits. We have worked with Talon, nickel deposits in the US. Uh, usually what we do, what we started doing is deploying on top of the drilling data because, you know, imagine you spend all your life drilling and suddenly someone comes and say, hey, by using geophysicists and data, I'll find you everything without you drilling. It's 
it's pretty it's good but it's intense so you know we deploy on top of their their um targets so that they can compare how accurate we are not just we were totally accurate and we identified pigmentite we also it, uh, start identifying under blind targets so the success was straight away and it is it. yeah what what else do you think you could use this for um things like uh sort of finding old civilizations and uh, doing different searches uh, as well, and also potentially climate change, environmental yeah. research. Yeah, absolutely. You know, think about the oceans, for example. You know, like now we are on land and we are trying, you know, to solve a big problem. What about all the oceans? You know, we can use the same technologies. It's acoustic beam forming yeah. to actually understand the subwater. Uh, now we are uh, speaking with, you know, uh, US and NASA about volcanoes and other planets as well. You yeah, know, we yeah. are going to the moon and Mars and how we're going to manage to scan them all without exploiting them. That I think is an important thing. This could be a technology that could really help water, find water and so forth. So it's quite amazing. Wonderful. Well, look, um, it's a it's a great Australian space story, uh, Fleet Space Technologies um, and Flavia there in Adelaide in your warehouse. And obviously the background noise at least the crew is working. That's the main thing. Uh, and uh, and obviously, hopefully, uh, they'll uh, have a watch of this uh, particular interview. So fascinating uh, company. We'll have a link to in the show notes as well. And I might even do a bit of an overlay with some of your video uh, on that particular session. So thank you very much. Flavia Tara Nadini, the CEO and co-founder with Fleet Space Technologies. Thank you. Thanks for having me, guys. Great.